Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Pablo Costa. I'm the VP of Engineering um, at Prescient, and I'm joined by uh, Kerr Brown and Jesse Cox uh, from WAGO, uh, who will introduce themselves um, <clears throat> when they get uh, their turn at the mic. Um, and we're really, really happy to uh, to be here and to uh, talk about how to scale node resolutions in uh, WAGO's excellent edge controllers. Uh, what we have um, in the agenda for today is a quick introduction about uh, Prescient, then talk about the designer architecture and the new features in the big uh, designer 2.0 release. And then I'll turn it over to, um, to Kurt and Jesse, who will talk about how, well, first of all, uh, introduce Wagos edge controllers and all the excellent line of uh, IoT hardware they have, and then uh, uh, Kurt will, will show a demo, um, high, <clears throat> high wire act as, as always uh, with a live demo, but um, how to deploy uh, in multiple uh, devices uh, with Prescient Designer. That's what we have in, uh, in stock and, uh, for today. So let's get going. Um, and Prescient, our tagline is that we realize, we help people realize the value of edge data at scale and fast. Uh, we currently are helping more than 75 companies in their digital transformation process. And as a team, we have uh, 20 years of hardware and system experience, so all the way from transistors um, in a high-speed mixing oil chip that goes into a 5G tower, um, from there all the way to um, the complex systems and, and software. And specifically in an IoT, we have more than 10 years of experience. Previous ventures have um, deployed more than uh, half a million uh, devices uh, that are currently in the field. So very strong team that can tackle um, most IoT uh, challenges. So what do we do um, in a <clears throat> 30 seconds? It's uh, through our uh, low code tool, we help um, engineers create and deploy solutions very, very quickly, uh, much, more, uh, much quicker than alternative and deploy them uh, to any number of devices and once uh, we unlock that, then you, those engineers, those applications can uh, gather data from a variety of physical and digital sources and process and dashboard it uh, either at the edge, at a cloud or both. And I mentioned engineers because that's uh, really, it's, it's a platform that allows anybody to, to develop this particularly um, appealing for uh, IoT engineers who are domain experts, not necessarily software engineers. So they, they can, they are empowered uh, to scratch their own itch and build applications that solve their problems. In terms of the system uh, that, that we offer, I'll start from, um, from the right. Um, the cloud portion of it is present designer. Uh, so I mentioned it's, it's, it's in the cloud. Uh, think of it as a industrial grade supercharged, super feature distributed node red that is hosted. We um, by default install uh, and you can use uh, InfluxDB as a time series database and uh, TensorFlow as the AI engine. Um, that's uh, just by customer pool. Doesn't mean that the only things that, that you can run uh, in terms of the AI, you can run uh, any uh, framework that you want, Keras, PyTorch, et cetera. Um, and also we can uh, connect uh, Grafana too. I think Influx and Grafana is a pretty popular um, combination, uh, at least um, in our customers. And uh, the NPM logo is here because as you may know, um, Node-RED has um, more than 3000 uh, modules or extra packages that you can install and use both contributed by uh, volunteers in an open source fashion or by first party like uh, Wago, for example, has their own um, no red module. So that's that first part of the module. Uh, but if uh, a company uh, or clients or, or someone else wants to have private um, or has a proprietary IP, then we support private registries, meaning uh, they can develop modules that only they can see and install. So that's the uh, cloud portion of the system. Uh, all the way to the left is the edge. And uh, here you can see that we support a heterogeneous 
uh, network all sorts of hardware. Uh, you picture here is the PFC 200 that uh, Kurt's going to use today to give you a demo. This is 758, which is an awesome edge device. Um, and essentially, when you have the hardware, you install uh, pressing edge. That's how you provision devices into the uh, pressing system. And what you uh, what is installed in that pressing edge is the edge manager, which is the control plane. Um, that does all the system administration, all the installing packages, flows, etc. Uh, then we have uh, just stock no red, so unmodified no red. So your the flows that you develop in designer uh, run uh, unmodified no red. And then to match the offerings that we have in the cloud, there's also a local version of Influx and TensorFlow. So um, those uh, pressing edge can be installed. Um, what we call natively, if um, if the edge device runs any uh, <clears throat> Debian or Debian-based distribution like Ubuntu, or uh, in the case of the many um, Wacom controllers in a container. If it, it runs Docker, you can install it as, as a container. Connecting the edge to uh, other edge devices and or to uh, designer is a brokers. It sits in the middle. It's um, uh, based on MQTT, it's TLS encrypted, and it has two, um, two channels. One is uh, the control uh, channel, which is uh, used by Prussian to uh, communicate with the edge manager, and as I said, do all the system administration, system management, uh, flow, deployment, etc. And then the, the uh, data channel, which is uh, where the user data comes. And those are two separate channels. They don't see each other. Uh, and for uh, customers that have um, uh, privacy reasons uh, for um, um, like GDPR or HIPAA, uh, the data broker uh, could be run by them and then um, there'll be an extra layer of um, security and privacy. So um, just a quick note that we don't, um, the system does not pres prescribe any, any data path. As you see here, there are some physical um, data sources, some digital data sources, and the Data journey can be any, any. Uh, for example, it can be directly to present designer and then from present designer to the public cloud like uh, Influx Cloud or a Snowflake or any other service. Or if it makes sense, um, the sensor data can go to uh, connect to present edge. For example, if you just plug in a sensor to, to the edge um, device and have some local processing, maybe some backup um, storage. And then from there, it can go to present designer to uh, get aggregation and further processing and then to the public cloud or directly from present edge uh, to the cloud. So um, we don't prescribe the, the data path and the, the data journey hardly ever ends in designer, right? So it's whatever makes sense for the application we support. So uh, we've been working really hard in the uh, last few months in our what we call Designer 2. And uh, I'll, I'll start going through some of the tentpole features uh, of that release. Um, one of the most important ones is that uh, we are uh, moving to No Red 2. And that brings you a, a bunch of very exciting features. Uh, one of the very important ones, and I think one of the key ones, is that uh, uh, function nodes can now uh, specify their own NPM modules. Uh, and these are not just no red modules, any, mod uh, any module that's in NPM and literally hundreds of thousands there can be used in the function uh, node. And of course, once you put that in designer, now what we do is like if, if that uh, function node gets uh, deployed to a, a device, all those modules get automatically installed for you. So with uh, designers renowned ease of use, you don't have to even think about it. You just use it as you would do in regular Node-RED. Um, additionally, uh, and this is also could be appealing for uh, engineers, you can uh, now have uh, subflows, you can package them as modules and install them. Um, the process is a little bit um, not super easy to do, but we have experience in it. So if, if you have any need, just contact us we can uh, help you and guide you through a process to do that. Um, additionally, um, Node-RED 2 supports MQTT version 5 and all the uh, features that it has. And of course, uh, too many usability enhancements to list here, but um, are very um, helpful uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, work. So 
uh, no red two update is the first uh, huge uh, feature. The other one is uh, that we have completely redesigned and, and vastly improved the, um, the device sidebar, which is the uh, manifestation of the distributed nature of, of uh, designer where you see all the devices where you have pressing edge run on them. Uh, you see at the top, you have an at a glance um, view of the status of the machines. And then um, the device sidebar has been uh, vastly improved um, with a goal of um, increasing the information density, which is key when you have hundreds of devices uh, provisioned. So you can see at a glance, it's very easy to see this device is disconnected. And when this um, little sidebar is green, everything's okay. If it's orange, it means that there's a warning or alert of uh, some kind. Uh, in this case, the alert is that uh, the edge node rate has stopped and there's several, obviously, as you know, if you use designer, there's several uh, ways to, to um, uh, address that, that problem. Um, other um, warnings alerts you can get is if the flows are not synchronized or if you're low memory on disk. But also we, have, we are now surfacing um, a whole host of system information. And this is just a start, we'll, we'll keep increasing the, um, the system information they get. Uh, for example, you, you can get what the CPU is, uh, the interface that's used in the MAC address, the IP address, et cetera, a whole host of uh, system information. And again, this is just right clicking on, on the device, will expand and, and show you uh, all this information. And if you, I'm sorry, if you uh, left click it, and if you right click it, you get the context menu where you have all the system administration tasks as before. So very big improvement in the edge sidebar. Uh, but um, that's, that's great. But what we heard from customers that like they have that information, a human can see it, but can you use it in your flows? And we had started on the latest releases of Designer 1 um, to at least expose what subflows were being used by devices, but we have vastly improved the, um, the information that we surface and that you can use in your flows through a mechanism, um, through two ways, essentially. Um, if the flow context variable has a devices in use variable and the global context has a devices provisioned variable. And what do these variables have? Well, they have, uh, you can see the status information, which is you see here. It's, it's the same information that you see in the sidebar, but you can use it programmatically. Then you have the properties, uh, uh, property of these uh, variables, and it has all the system information that you see in the device's sidebar. Then you have the subflow information where you have essentially all the information of the subflows that have been deployed to a particular device. As you can see, you have the, the flow where it is, the node ID, the name, et cetera, et cetera. So you can uh, use this in your, in your flows. But additionally, we have a user uh, property where it's free form. So all the, all the other uh, status properties and subflows are read only, but this user is read and write. And you can put any metadata you want there. And it goes, um, it's permanently and, and persistently stored, which um, essentially opens the possibility to, to uh, place information that's relevant to your application for any particular device. So you can start using this uh, in Designer 2. As a, as a use case, as, as an example, we have created a device status node. Uh, and again, you can um, install this via the Pilot Manager. And what this node does is you can select um, what devices you wanna watch, either all devices or individual devices. And when any information in, in, the, uh, in the object that I showed you before changes, like the status changes or the properties changes, or if you change your, the, or something changes the user uh, defined information of the devices that are being watched, then this, this, device, this node would emit a message. Or you can also send a message to its input, say, with the devices that you want to get the information for. What it allows you to do is the very simple cases have a, a device dashboard very, very easily. And this is, this is the flow that, that creates this dashboard where the information here is updated dynamically as, you know, as, as the device's status or properties change, this will change uh, in real time. So I think this unlocks um, many possibilities once you have this information about all the devices in the system. And of course, this notice, um, as any of the uh, nodes that we create have extensive documentation and support from us. 
Finally, and, and to a mirroring the NoRed2 uh, usability enhancements, we have also um, paid particular attention to customer feedback and have added um, usability enhancement throughout the system. Uh, three that, that I would highlight today is uh, once you deploy, sometimes you have very complex design and you, you know, hierarchical with subflows and within subflows, within subflows, and you change something at the you know, bottom of that hierarchy, you might not realize that that was being used in multiple devices and maybe some of those devices you don't want to update. So when you hit deploy, now you get uh, this dialogue where you can, you see all the devices that are gonna be updated and you can deselect the ones that you don't want to update. And once the, the deployment starts going, you actually get um, a step-by-step -step, uh, deployment uh, updates of all the devices. So you can see where uh, what's going on and uh, this, mostly so that um, if you have slow devices, you see where, where it's going and how, how far it, it has gone. On, on the edge, so this, these two uh, items are on, on the designer side. On the edge, um, now uh, the present edge that uh, is coupled with designer two has, uh, you can configure it as, as, as Kurt will show uh, through the command line. And I think that's the appropriate way for, for mass deployment. But if you have once your 2Z devices and, and you want to just see what the configuration is or configure it in a more graphical way, now uh, we have a browser-based configuration where you can see what, the, um, you can get the designer ID, the device ID, and, and you have some um, system information too. So um, a user-friendly way to, uh, uh, to configure the device. So those uh, in essence are the, uh, uh, the features that we have. Uh, if you want to uh, try a designer, uh, just go to our uh, website, pressingdevices.com, and there's a big um, uh, start for free button. Just click in there. There's a quick form they fill, and then that's the way you get an account. So um, with that being said, um, I'm going to turn over to uh, Jesse, who's um, going to tell us all about Wagos Edge controllers. Great, thanks, Pablo. Let me just share my screen here. <clears throat> All right, hopefully you can see this. Great, well, first I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jesse Cox. I'm a senior application engineer with uh, WAGO's um, open source Linux and IoT industry group. Um, I serve uh, North America. Uh, along with my colleague, Kurt, who will introduce himself later. And I just wanted to, to get started by doing a quick introduction to our hardware platform and talking through some of the some of the features that allow us to run something as cool as the prescient edge on our device. So um, we'll zoom all the way out here uh, quickly and, and just make a quick introduction to, to Wago as a company. Um, we're a company based out of Germany. Uh, we have a North American headquarters in Germantown, Wisconsin. Uh, we've been in this business for quite a long time. Um, initially introducing the first spring terminal, uh, DIN mount terminal block to the market. And um, in the mid 90s, we, we entered into the automation space uh, by introducing the industry's first slice type IO um, as um, field bus IO. Uh, back then. So since then, we've iterated on PLCs. We introduced a, a, an award-winning, uh, excuse me, an award-winning Ethernet-based PLC to the market um, in the, the late 90s. And we've continued the trend of, of trying to stay ahead of the, the technology curve throughout. Um, in the mid-2010s, we released our PFC 200 product to the industrial control market. Uh, which was one of the industry's first Linux-based PLCs that also introduced technologies like Docker. Um, and that's really where we embraced our, our um, open source you know, spirit and started building things in parallel to a traditional PLC runtime. So um, our IoT-based hardware platform for 2022 makes use of the, the legacy of the modularity of the backplane um, in our PLCs, but also expands that into other devices um, in, in the con control side. Beginning at the bottom here with our PFC 100 and PFC 200 products, um, these are ARM-based controllers. Uh, the PFC 100 is a 
a 600 megahertz A8. The PFC 200 is a one gigahertz A8. Um, these make use of our IO system, our slice IO system. So they're completely modular in the hardware. And it allows you to put this open source controller up front of some really powerful IO modules, which I'll talk about a little more um, in the next slide. Next, we have our, our touch panel 600 and our edge controllers. Um, these are quad core A9 processors uh, that bring a bit more horsepower to the edge. So these are a, a bit like a blend between an industrial PC and a PLC. But uh, this allows us to make use of, of parallel processing. We can multi-thread and we can do some really neat things to, to weld together the, the PLC runtime and uh, more standard computing tasks. And then finally, the edge computer um, at the top here, which is our newest uh, addition to our IoT product lineup, this is an intru a true uh, industrial PC. It's uh, based on an Intel Atom. It ships with Debian 10 operating system, um, and it has options for both four and eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, this is really a powerhouse. It's got some really neat software features that it ships with. So you don't you don't need to be a Linux uh, guru to to put this to use. It's got a, a web based interface that allows you to manage the device as well as access the shell without any special software. Um, and it's it's really built to um, bring powerful Linux computing to um, you know th those that may or may not have uh, a Linux background. Now, I, I talk a lot about future-proof hardware because the way our, our systems are designed, um, they're completely modular. So we can expand and contract systems as they need to, to fill applications. Um, typically, these start, uh, when we talk about our IP20 PLC type products, these start with a head unit um, that can be selected based on communication protocols, maybe computing, um, things like that. And then we can stack on IO modules to these. We have over 400 IO modules that we offer, um, everything from your standard digital and analog IO signals um, from five to two, excuse me, from five volts DC to 230 volts AC, um, and all the, the reasonable steps in between on digitals. Um, all of your, your, standard flavors of analog from zero to 10, plus or minus 10 volts DC, four to 20 temperature sensors, et cetera. Um, we also can directly feed in load cells, uh, strain gauges. Um, we can control proportional valve modules, um, add communications, et cetera. The, it's, it's a pretty deep breath of IO modules. So this allows us to take all the features from the software piece and apply this to our, our IO modules. Now, uh, with the exception of our edge computer, um, all of these products run the same um, or relatively same open source real-time Linux operating system. This is a, a very lightweight Linux uh, that is designed to host the PLC runtime. So it's got a real-time patch with the um, open source automation development labs preempt real-time patch, uh, but they all run a modern kernel 4.9. They, they um, are preloaded with a web server that's used for configuration of the devices. Uh, there's a web visualization component from the PLC as well. So these can run an HMI uh, directly on the web server. Because they're Linux, they have some really neat uh, networking functionality. Um, some of the most important things here, the high points are um, the ability to separate the ethernet ports. So on the PFC 200, for example, you can have up to four ethernet ports on a single device, each one of these can have um, isolated network settings. So for example, you can run something like Modbus in a network on a device that may also be exposed to the internet without exposing a Modbus port to the internet. Um, and this can be firewalled and whitelisted with um, um, whitelisted MAC addresses. These um, are also capable of running Docker, as I mentioned before, and Docker, um, is 
is something that is um, heavily leveraged on our platform to add features and functions to this. Um, these were um, several years ago also certified as AWS Greengrass um, devices. Our approach to software is really interesting. Um, I like to, to describe this as the, the choose your own adventure in a way um, when you take a, a controller out of the box and you you power it up that controller has a plc runtime um, with uh, e-cockpit which is our our programming software however um, this can be supplemented with all sorts of things because we run linux you can create your own binaries and c um, we can run other services in parallel like mqtt brokers um, it's it's got quite a quite a wide uh, breadth of features that that you can run um, and we can put these together modularly as well. So when you when you take the modular hardware piece and you apply the modular software piece, um, there are hundreds of thousands of combinations that you can come up with. So um, it's it's very um, capable of of bending into really specific tasks. Now, one of the problems that we run into in the IoT space is um, most of our communications are um, MQTT centric. The, the challenge that that presents is MQTT follows something that's, that's not common in, in you know, history of the PLC world with communications like Ethernet IP or Modbus, we're used to interacting with data registers, um, handing it offsets and going out and grabbing data based on, based on um, address positions. MQTT doesn't work that way. It, it uses uh, topics and payloads. And so we need to be able to, to process those payloads. There has been quite, quite a lot of work done in the IEC world to um, make this a little more straightforward. But at the end of the day, we're still dealing typically with arrays of ASCII bytes, also known as strings, and we're having to parse that data apart. So um, tools like Node-RED make it very easy to uh, take MQTT payloads and turn those into something that's that's workable, something that's actionable, um, and prescient. Prescient makes that that very possible and very easy to manage remotely um, on our platform. So, if you can see the workflow here, it's it's undeniable um, using JavaScript to parse MQTT versus an IEC language. Now, uh, I mentioned that we leverage Docker. Um, heavily on this platform. And for those of you that are not familiar with Docker and how Docker works, um, I'll just give you a, a bit of a flyover of, of how this behaves on our platform. So what you see here is a, a typical Linux operating system. You've got the, the kernel level, you've got the, the host operating system, which contains the binaries, libraries, data. You've got uh, the application layer that in our case, typically will run the PLC runtime. We may have, um, you know, C binaries or something that run on top of that. Docker creates this abstraction layer inside of that operating system and allows us to make use of local resources. Um, and it containerizes applications and is able to supplement some of that, um, you know, some, some of that functionality while um, not using something like a hypervisor, which is how you would do this with a virtual machine. So um, it's extremely lightweight. It, it makes these platforms very versatile, but it also, um, there's, there's an added feature to this, which it, it containerizes and isolates applications when they run on these platforms. So the way I describe it um, functionally is it behaves something like the app store where it allows you to install and run applications that behave like um, a, a standalone machine. Um, based on how you configure this. So we use this to run all sorts of different applications directly on our hardware. Um, in, in this case, for example, we could run the Prescient Edge software in a Docker container right alongside something like InflexDB for uh, time series data storage and Grafana for local dashboarding. Um, these are, are configured to either talk to one another or not talk to one another, um, and it gives you quite a lot of granularity with how you run applications and how those how those applications can interact both with the 
with the bare metal and other containers. One of our favorite tools at WAGO, um, when, you, when you interact with Kurt and I, we talk endlessly about Node-RED because of the, the things that it um, allows us to do. Node-RED is um, a very important innovation, I think, to our industry as well as other industries. But um, if you're not familiar with Node-RED, I, I imagine if you're on this um, webinar, you, you're probably at least somewhat familiar. It's a low-code browser-based programming environment that allows us to um, you know, leverage Node.js on, on our platform. Um, it allows for hyper-automation so we can achieve these really complex tasks very fast because of the contributions of the open source community. So something that we're really appreciative of. And Prescient allows us to do this, um, to manage these, these uh, runtimes remotely and use them to collect massive amounts of data. Um, there are thousands of contributions to the Node-RED world, including um, some that we've created here at WAGO, uh, but, but we, we find all the time things that are not possible to do in a traditional PLC runtime that, that we can find in the Node-RED world. So this is a, a fairly common use case for the, for the prescient uh, software for us is, is using it for remote management. So we may have developers all over the, the, the country or all over the world who need to um, manage projects remotely. Um, Node-RED, as I said before, has become a much more important component in our, in our toolkit. And uh, Prescient allows us to um, take, take these devices, take these pr projects and um, make geography really irrelevant with, um, with, with how we can work with these and our customers. Some applications that we see uh, with, with the, the Prescient technology and with our, our um, edge devices, um, we, we work in inner logistics. We see quite a bit of process automation and chemical handling, um, heavily deployed OEM equipment, mobile equipment, you know, virtually anything that you can um, squint and, and envision deployed out in the world. Um, for more information, you can find um, more product information as well as contact information for uh, uh, us and our groups here at um, www.wago.com. And with that, I'm going to turn it over next to my colleague, Kurt Braun, who will introduce himself. And thanks so much for joining. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Jesse. And uh, thanks, Pablo. Um, you guys did a really great job explaining the, the technology and the, the reasoning behind why you would want to use the, the prescient uh, software on Wago controllers. I think there's a lot of synergy there. I'm really excited about having this new technology available on our, on our platform. Um, I get to do the fun part. I get to do the actual live demo. So uh, why don't I just get started? <clears throat> so um, maybe I'll start with a quick introduction. Um, I'm Kurt Braun. I'm the IoT market specialist for, for Wago North America. I'm based in Southern California. And um, some of you may know, uh, I also maintain a, a private YouTube channel. Um, that's a shameless plug here, but uh, this is uh, a YouTube video that I published on Friday, which covers the onboarding process. So today, uh, as, as Pablo uh, explained, we're going to be onboarding a Wago controller onto the Prescient system. And then I'll be doing a very simple uh, explanation of how you deploy uh, the actual flows to your, your various um, devices. Uh, so to get started, um, as, as Jesse mentioned, you know we run Linux as the environment uh, for the operating system on, our, on our, our edge products, but you do not need to be an expert with Linux uh, to get this up and running. And um, to facilitate that, I've created a provisioning tool. So if you go to GitHub and you search for a PFC provisioning tool, um, there's a menu, menuing-based system that kind of automates uh, a lot of the steps that you need to do. So this command here, if you copy and paste this into the command line, um, it's going to give you pretty much, you know, all of the things that you need to do uh, to get started. So I'm just I'm making an SSH connection to the controller. And actually, let me, let me switch my camera so that you can see the hardware here. 
So we have two, two controllers here. This one is already on board, and this is the one that we're going to be working on. We're going to bring this on board as well. <clears throat> so I've connected to, to this controller, which is um, at the IP address 5.34. So I'm going to just paste this, um, this command in here, and this will bring up this little menu. So the first thing we need to do is install Docker. Uh, this takes a, a few minutes. I've already gone through uh, the installation of Docker. So you would just press one and then enter to do that. The second thing we need to do is disable the PLC runtime. We're gonna be doing all of the logic control within the Node-RED environment on, on, on the prescient runtime. So we don't need the PLC IEC 6.11.31-3 uh, uh, runtime. So we're gonna disable that. Um, then we need to install the, uh, the KBUS MQTT daemon. This is a really cool uh, tech that lets you interact with the IO modules. So we have like a, a digital output module and, an, and a digital input module and analog input module. So we can interact with those IO points just with MQTT, which, which is, if you've used Node-RED, you, you know already that MQTT is very easy to work with uh, in that environment because it's, it's all JSON. So um, we're going to go ahead and just press number four. And this will pull the software and install automatically onto your controller. The next thing we have to do is install a local broker. Because it's MQTT, uh, it's, it needs a, a broker to exchange the IO data with the runtime. So if we go into number five, which is install containers, and then we install number letter B, which is Mosquito, then that will um, basically pull the Mosquito uh, container and, and instantiate it. Uh, so then we're ready to exit out of there. And um, we have to configure the KBUS daemon to talk to the broker because it, it can talk to local broker, it could talk to another broker that's on your network. So to do that, we're going to use Nano. And in the uh, this uh, is where the location of the config file is. And the only change we have to do is go in here and set this node ID and make sure that the endpoint is, is pointing to this uh, local host address. So once that's done, you can exit and reboot the controller. All right, the last step is to pull the prescient container. And in, in this YouTube video, um, if you scroll down into the description, it has, um, a template for, for that command here. So the only thing is you have to do is you have to supply your designer ID and you have to give a name to the device. So if you go into your and, and log into your prescient uh, designer account, you can see, uh, you know, here is my the name of my device. So we'll probably want to give this, well, we have to give it a unique name. You can't use the same name twice. That would, um, you know, not work. So we're going to call this like, second device my PFC number two, and it's going to show up right here. And then we need to tie that to our account. So uh, if I go into my um, settings, so this is the device ID. And incidentally, if, if you're using our Edge computer, which just runs Linux, um, it, it doesn't need, you don't have to use Docker. So you could just actually run this whole command line from that Linux device and it would onboard your, that device into your account. But since we're using Docker, we have to um, do a slightly different uh, methodology here. So I'm just gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste that here. And then I'm going to change this to my PFC2. I'm just gonna copy that, go back to putty. And I'm just going to run this from the command line. So this is going to pull the container, instantiate it with those environmental variables. And in a few minutes, um, you'll see the controller show up here. But in the meantime, um, I'm going to explain how this flow works, which is going to get into working with the IO uh, on the PFC series. And I think that's really where the, the advantage comes in with using Wago's uh, controllers with the prescient because it's it's really easy to do. So uh, without getting into 
too much detail. I don't want this to be a Node-RED tutorial, but um, we're, we're using what's called a subflow. And so when you go into the subflow, this is where you would select which devices you want to deploy that code onto. What you're seeing outside of this is what's running in the in your Node-RED instance that's running on the Prescient Designer. So like these, these um, nodes are actually not deployed onto a device, but all the code within, within this subflow is deployed to the device. So this is how we can interact with multiple devices and uh, debug and, and turn things on and off um, uh, from, from within this environment. So why don't we just I'll take a quick look at how, how this works. So I have this uh, debug window here. And if I click this true, what we get, what's being sent into this subflow is uh, a topic, which is set output, a destination, which is the name of the device that you want to send this command to, and then the payload, which is a true in this case. This could be anything you want it to be could be passed into the subflow. What, what this function does, all it does is it, it adds the topic and the destination, which is um, what's used to filter which device this command is being sent to. So in, in within here, uh, this subflow is basically filtering uh, based on this destination and only sending it to where you want it to. If you leave this off, it's going to be sent to all the devices. And in some cases, you may want to do that. Then within this subflow, uh, so if you're not familiar with subflow, basically you have an input and, and you can have multiple outputs and you can wire your flows you know, to those. So we, we sent this, um, the, the topic is set output. So we can use the switch um, node to filter and, and direct the flow of, of that command. So in this case, set output is gonna go to number two. And there's another command that we have, which is get IP that goes to pin number one. So pin number two then goes to this, this set of nodes. And if I um, go down to these uh, nodes that I've already installed, this is um, so if you install the node red contrib Wago palette, that's going to give you uh, these these seven nodes, and these are helper nodes to work with the MQTT. And um, essentially, all you have to do is drag, you know, digital input, digital output, and it's very easy. You, you don't need to know anything about how the how the PLC handles the K bus is what we call the, the IO bus. You just have to specify the module number. So in this case, um, you know, the output is is module number one, and the channel. This is a, a four channel module, so uh, the output is the first output would be channel number one. And then this pointing to the MQTT broker. So we have um, already defined the uh, local host as the broker. So we installed the MQTT uh, mosquito broker as a container. And we're using unencrypted, but you could use encrypted if you, if you wanted to. And then if you remember, we edited the config file with the name KFC 200. So, um, that is going to route that true or false to this module. It's going to turn this module output on and off. So if we go back to here, and if you can see the little light turning on and off, actually beyond this one. Um, so the light's off, light's on. Now this is all being done through the internet. Um, this is my PDI account. This goes to the subflow running in the container and then is returned back um, to the output here. So um, the, uh, the next thing we've, we've done here is we're, we're also tying it to the input. So we have another uh, broker connection for inputs. And what this does is anytime an input changes, it's gonna send an MQTT message uh, into this node. And this is our digital input. So we, we're, we're looking for module number two, uh, which is this one, and channel number one, which is what this uh, switch and wire are are wired into, and uh, and then that is going to be uh, a topic is going to be added to that, which is indicating that it's a digital input, and that's what gets sent out of this output. So if you follow it here, it's going to go into this switch, which is um, looking at the different 
PLC devices. And then from there, it goes into this switch, which is then looking for the, you know, if it's a digital input or whatever it is that we're, we're looking to get returned from that subflow and monitor, we can then route that to the correct um, uh, function here. And this, all, this, all these functions do is use node status to display the, the, the value. So if I toggle input one, you can see digital input one is true, false, true, false. I also have a thermal couple. So if I, if I warm this thermal couple up, so some, it's a loose wire here, but yeah. So here you can see the temperature coming in and that's, that's very simple to do. I just have this thermos, thermocouple module is module number three, channel number two. So it's, it's really, it's child's play <laughs> to, to, to do this kind of programming. I'm also using this uh, IP node, which um, returns the local IP address. Sometimes it's helpful to know um, what the local IP address is. If, if you imagine these are installed in remote facilities and if somebody goes to the location, they may want to remotely you know, or locally connect to that device um, to do command line stuff. So this will return that local IP address. So if we go back to our um, devices list, you can see our second PLC is, is now on board. And so we can just basically take um, a duplicate of that code and oops, just wire that in. And then we just have to select that second PLC as our deployed uh, for our fleet. Art, and then we can... I think I think you want to connect the output to this switch. Oh, that's right. Thanks for that. <clears throat> and this is a point where you start praying for the demo. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the beauty of live demos with, with the eight minutes left. But I, I think you, you can see how, how easy it is to deploy, um, you know, code across multiple devices. I'll just fix this real quick here. When you deploy, uh, it only deploys any changes. So it's actually not touching PLC one at all um, because we we didn't change anything in the logic for that device. So uh, it, it's very efficient if you're doing uh, connections across a metered line, you're not incurring a lot of uh, unnecessary data traffic across those um, metered connections. Yeah, and it's touching uh, PFC two because the uh, we move the wire from it, from its output, so it's the instantiating in the communication network, right? Yeah. So we can test that if we click true and false. Let me uh, toggle this input. Oh, there, it's not connected yet, so. So I just realized that the IO light is not lit on the PLC here. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we'll uh, 
have to end here, but uh, this was working <laughs> 10 minutes ago or 10 minutes before the webinar. So I apologize. It for is the... working for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, let me say that um, if, um, let me put up, if you want to um, know more about it, if, uh, about either pressure or WAGO, um, I'm showing the, um, uh, the, our contact information. As I mentioned, if you want to um, get a designer uh, trial account, uh, you can go to pressiondevice.com and um, just uh, click the uh, <clears throat> try it for free button. Uh, so uh, in the few minutes that we have, we had a bunch of questions that um, hopefully have been um, addressed. And oh, just, just, just answer that one. So, um, if you have any other questions, um, now is the time to put in the chat. Um, otherwise, I would just say that, um, Rich Rader, thank you for being here. We had a quite a great turnout. Um, and if you can take just a few seconds to fill out this, the survey, that would um, help um, both WAGO and, and us um, produce more content that's applicable and, and relevant um, to you. So uh, one question that I got through chat was, um, what are the security features around the pressing MQTT broker? Yeah, so I have mentioned um, the all communications uh, TLS encrypted. Uh, and uh, as far as the user data is concerned, if uh, there are any special security requirements or if uh, by law they have to they cannot use our broker. Uh, we can definitely use the broker to um, uh, a user broker to to route all the, all the user data. Um, that that's certainly feasible. I have another question. I think probably this is for either Kurt or Jesse. Have you seen the agility of Node Red slash Designer provide benefit to your project implementation? Yeah, yeah that's an take that easy one. answer. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. Um, you know, the alternative to using Prescient is using like VPNs, and that adds a whole level of complexity and cost. And uh, by deploying the runtime, by deploying, deploying your logic within the Node-RED runtime, you, it just simplifies the whole project, and it becomes very achievable, where uh, having to do it with the uh, kind of older technology um, it, it is much more difficult to implement. All right, and I think uh, one last question in the interest of time, why should I use Pressing Designer instead of stock no red? Okay, so I will just show, flash this um, slide. And these are all the things that we uh, provide. Um, and I should say this, no red is an awesome platform. <laughs> We're just building in the shoulders of giants, right? So we're um, we're adding um, a whole host of functionality to make um, <clears throat> engineers able to, as I said, to uh, create distributed applications, IoT applications, data operation applications, workflow automation applications, make that um, faster, quicker, easier, and better. Um, so um, it's it's not that no red is bad, it's just we just um, enhancing it in, in ways that um, are pertinent for the application. So I have a question. So if pressing eliminates VPNs altogether, how would one make changes on the controllers remotely? Do you still get SSH access through pressing? Uh, you do not get SSH access through pressing. Um, there are different ways depending on, on the controller, how you can, um, make system changes uh, to the controller. Um, so for example, in the SEM58, you can install it as, um, as, <clears throat> as native, and then you have um, essentially can shell out to any commands that, that uh, you want to, uh, and run any commands that you want to do system administration. Uh, but yeah, we do not provide SSH uh, access. Uh, Pablo, I wrote a... Um... A proof of concept it's a it's on github it's called crabgrass and it lets you set up an, a tls connection 
to uh, an external broker and that you can send SSH commands via MQTT messages to the device. So if you wanted to provision your container or reboot the controller, you could do that all through MQTT commands coming from a broker through a TLS connection to the device. All right, Crabgrass, and have to give it to you. Awesome yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> Some naming. Uh, so another question, and perhaps this last one, because we're right against the hour. Uh, maximum, how many, oh, just scroll, how many devices we can connect Wago devices on centralized cloud of Amazon ERP? I'm not exactly sure what the, <laughs> what the question is. So uh, Santosh, if uh, you can follow up with um, either Kurt, Jesse or I, then uh, we can perhaps answer that question um, more um, to your satisfaction. And as designer goes, uh, there's no limit. I mean, you just provision, um, you know, it's not a prison agent, however many devices you want. And uh, the idea is that we make it easy to scale to one, 10, 100, it's, it's all kind of the same. Uh, one, yeah. one last thing. Um, when we talk about maximum devices, typically we're in the hundreds, in, in hundreds. So, um, yeah. Message us, mess, message us after this, and we'd be happy to discuss that application with you. So uh, just a quick update. I rebooted the controller, and uh, it's working now, the second controller. Oh. So if awesome. you want me to yeah, share yeah, my please. screen real quick yep. just to prove that uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sleep tonight with, if I know. <laughs> with Kurt, it's like, it's like holding a sneeze. <laughs> yeah, so done. you can see here, um, when I toggle this input, you see the status changing. And you know I can get the IP address of this device. So there's the five. There you go. Before. So it does work. Just had to reboot. I, I missed that step. Um, there you go. I'll control the lead when, whenever. I think what uh, <laughs> I think what happened is you um, you changed the config file and didn't restart the. That's the right. Yeah, yeah, it's real real easy thing to do. Great, great for the uh, and thank you for all the uh, questions and the participation. It's awesome. Um, because you're registered when uh, we're going to share the, the uh, presentation and uh, we're going to share the recording of this uh, webinar when it's available. So you get an email uh, with the links there. And again, uh, feel free to contact Jesse, um, Kurt or I uh, for any follow-ups or if anything wasn't clear, we would be happy to talk to you. Uh, and with that, I, please fill out the uh, survey, take just a few seconds. And I thank you so very much for your um, uh, attendance and have a good rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thank you.